provide appropriate oversight. If this fails, folks, it takes the agenda of everyone in this room down with it. Then again, being a guy who always thinks the glass is more than half full, success at this breeds success. If we can demonstrate how the nonprofit community, active in various ways with federal dollars, and pushing governments, state and local governments, in the way they need to be pushed, it pretty much proves the case of what we're all about. So success is what we're after. Let's look at who's mining the store. There is a federal accountability board that was established by President Obama, an advisory <coughs> panel that has yet to be appointed, and federal inspectors general, I'm not sure how you make that a plural, but let's say inspectors generals, uh, who have a budget collectively, and this may be news to some of you, of a quarter of a billion, B, billion dollars. So they're armed and dangerous, and they're headed by Earl Devane, who is the guy who caught Jack Abramoff, who some of you may remember from his lobbying days. We have a state accountability officer, we have a state transparency officer, uh, one of whom is here today, the person of Matt Fritz. We have a stimulus project oversight officer and agency accountability offices, officers will be appointed, and of course, the always thrilling state auditors who will be involved. Shelley mentioned a couple of governmental websites. There's also a, a, a plethora, a lot, of uh, non-governmental websites. But here's the important thing. It is all of our job, oversight provisions of this act. It's all of our jobs. And instead of looking at it as an added burden, I think it's really an evolution of what all of us must do in the foundation community and in the nonprofit community. Feel free to challenge that, but I think that's, to me, a more apt way of describing this. Everyone's job has evolved to improve this role. So what's in the mix? I'm not sure if it's uh, three billion, if I got the number right, more or less. These days, a billion, more or less. Uh, through formula grants, competitive grants, and all other things that uh, Shelley described. The last two bullets here, last three bullets. <coughs> keep in mind, there's loans and loan guarantees. Somebody needs to keep an eye on how those dollars are spent. Tax provisions. There's a report I just saw, I haven't read it yet, on tax expenditures and the reporting actually being able to do that. Let me describe a couple of things. When I talked to the Federal Accountability Office, uh, I wasn't able to speak with Mr. Bain, but some of his staff, the perception I got was that they definitely are looking for waste, fraud, fraud and abuse. Uh, the three amigos, waste, fraud, and abuse, are what inspectors general tend to look for. Uh, what concerned me, however, from that discussion, and which may be of concern with how the state views the accountability role, has to do with some of the things that Shelley thankfully described to you, and which I'm sure are clear to you already. Maintenance of effort, supplement not supplant. These are accounting terms that are absolutely critical to how dollars are spent. Remember what I said? Dollars need to be spent effectively and as intended. Later we'll have a call and response on that. <laughs> <laughs> effectively and as intended. And if you don't spend dollars to supplement budgets, whether it's energy or education or any of the areas where that's a federal requirement, to me, that is something that should be subject to how these accountability boards at a state and federal level do their job. You can use funds not in a wasteful way. You can use funds not in a fraudulent way. You can use funds in ways that are not intended and ask yourself, is that waste, fraud, and abuse? So if it's not the three amigos, are there other parts of this that are relevant, and I think there are when you look at eligible uses of funds, many of which are spelled out in federal law, but not the stimulus bill. A quick example is the energy bill. The uh, 2007 energy bill spells out the eligible uses for conservation block grants, energy conservation block grants. Now, Roger Koontz, who's somewhere here in the audience, thankfully, is another great asset we have in Connecticut because he's a lawyer and he's smart and he knows these laws, and they establish the eligible uses. But it's local governments, as well as the state government, that are going to be spending these dollars and making these decisions. Think of all the vigilance that's required just in that area alone. And that's only one small part of this bill. Another thing that is, I think, an attribute of the website that has been developed in Connecticut and at a federal level is that we can keep track of the certifications and assurances that are required in order to receive federal funds. Uh, it's interesting, if you go on the federal site, uh, for the first couple of weeks, uh, you can see a map of the United States. And you can see that Bobby Jindal in Louisiana had really not decided to take any money, and therefore there was no 
state website. But after a while, everybody got on board except, uh, unfortunately, North uh, Dakota because of the flood. But you can keep track of what certifications and assurances have been made. And that's extremely important to demonstrate to you and to us that this is not business as usual. The level of oversight and transparency, Shelley already said this, but it bears repeating, is unprecedented business. There are customary whistleblower protections, uh, and also reporting and progress monitoring. So I'm not an expert in early childhood education. I, I play one on TV, but one of the most important things, a concept in that education area, is progress monitoring. In other words, let's just look at this not as trying to catch people, although that's important, but also allowing for some course corrections as they go. Let's watch the progress here, and let's leave room for ourselves to be helpful, uh, to be constructive critics uh, when we need to be, whether we're in the nonprofit world or the world of philanthropy. So waste, fraud, and abuse, like uh, most bad movies, you know it when you see it. Uh, the core definition, I say Jack Abramoff meets Earl Devaney, uh, Earl Devaney won. Uh, don't risk being front page news. This is somewhat of a stern message. If you look at some areas of the stimulus package, and if you look at some of the reports of the inspectors general that have already been issued, the federal inspectors general, by the way, have all issued reports. They identify areas where you could anticipate some problems. And one of those areas, uh, among many, is the area of weatherization, weatherizing homes. So here in Connecticut, we go from a budget of 2.5 million a year to 65 million. Now, no one needs to say anything accusatory to ask yourself the question, that's a lot of ramping up. That's a steep ramp. I would not exercise on that ramp. That is a very steep increase in funds. Therefore, that's an area where you say, we should lay on a little extra oversight. So, you know, we have cap agencies in Connecticut that deliver those funds, and I think do it well. But this is a big increase. And you can go through some of these Inspector General reports and identify areas that need a little extra uh, observation. Now, the reason that's important is not only to make sure that the money is spent effectively and as intended, but it also has a political dimension. Now, Glenn Beck, to me, is the antithesis of John Q. Citizen. That's a political statement, I know. But you can bet that he's going to make a living off of writing stories or being on television talking about waste, fraud, and abuse and other nasty things that have come from the stimulus package. He's probably already written them, or whoever writes this stuff has already written these stories. But John Q. Citizen, or James Q. Citizen, is us. And so one of the things that we have to do is provide this oversight to prevent any uh, affiliation with the three amigos. But the other part of this is to prevent wrongdoing, to prevent bad behavior before it starts. This is why President Obama, Vice President Biden, the heads of all the federal agencies, have brought people in from the states and said over and over again, for those who might not use the funds effectively and as maintenance of effort and supplement not supplant is really important. I think if you look at an example, this is a real life example, Superintendent A. By the way, I didn't name names here, but this is an actual true story ripped from the headlines in Connecticut. A superintendent of a local school district says, we should have gotten more flexibility out of these funds. The rules aren't clear as to how we spend uh, IDEA, which is special education funds, which are meant to be supplemental. And we should have access to a waiver that gets us out of this jam. The business manager of the same school district said, and this is a quote, the rules are clear, the funds can't be used to supplant existing funding, and we should focus on programs that achieve the educational goals of the stimulus and don't leave us out on a limb when the funds run out. This is all within one school district. So now you're thinking, here's a whole other area we got to keep an eye on. Now I'm using energy and education examples because that's about all I know. There's transportation, unemployment, health, a lot of other things. Keep these as illustrative examples. Uh, eligible uses, I think I covered all of that. Uh, you can go back to the original legislation. Uh, you can make a great contribution, by the way, by familiarizing yourself with what the eligible uses are of these funds. Certifications and assurances, I think Shelley covered that uh, quite a lot. Uh, lots of things to sign, by the way. If you ever want to make anybody in the corporate world nervous, just ask them to sign something. <laughs> Even a birthday card. I mean, it's just, <laughs> signing has its own impact. And I think they take it very seriously. So, 
keep in mind that this is real stuff. This isn't made up. This is unprecedented. It's not business as usual. I talked about whistleblower protection. It's important to know that it extends to all recipients of funding, whether it's in the nonprofit world or the for-profit world or government. We talked about reporting and progress monitoring. Remember that this is a vast job. There's a lot of programs here. But here's an interesting thing on the reporting. Um, depending, again, how you look at the world, uh, I think there's an opportunity for some complaint here. Uh, for those who have to do the reporting, let's say you're an arts agency, right? And so somehow, let's hope, some of the federal dollars make their way down to an arts organization. So now you have to spend them, and you have to report on how you create jobs. So arts agencies, uh, and fortunately we have a very good one in the state, now have to report on job creation. Well, that's mind-bending. But if you look at it in a good news way, remember I said earlier about the value, don't, it's not what you're called, it's what you answer to. Think of yourselves as job creators, job folks who can retain jobs. It's not why you get up in the morning necessarily. But now we're going to have to add to our portfolio the ability to describe how our work in the world of philanthropy and also in the nonprofit world creates jobs. Uh, we need some technical help with that, I'm pretty sure. But that's an important thing. If it's in the energy world, you have to report on how you reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And these are recurring reports. Various agencies have to file them. I think one could look at it in reporting. Uh, we might at least start by understanding how we can do this together, particularly in areas where it is about job creation. This reporting allows for course corrections, and it applies to decision-making bodies. For example, the working group that I Matt uh, would have described earlier legislative committees, et cetera. I will say that one of the things that I hope uh, uh, occurs going forward is that some of the decision-making bodies that have been established at a state level that needed to come together quickly given the transportation infrastructure decision-making can find a way to involve the public a bit more broadly without, without getting in the way of moving uh, quickly on these things. I talked about what we look for. Um, one bullet here, the third bullet here. Incompetence is criminal. Okay, I think I was having a little too much coffee when I wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> or else I'd be in jail. Uh, point me that, again, you say, well, you know, such and such agency, they didn't, they didn't steal the money, they didn't waste it, it's not fraud, they didn't really abuse it. I don't know what abusing money is, I suppose gambling is abusing money, but yeah, they didn't do that. Well, you know what? It is no longer good enough to be mediocre. It doesn't put you in jail. So forget the criminal part, although I hope I got your attention. Uh, and we need to hold ourselves and others up to a higher standard. We talked about eligible uses. Look at eligible uses. Look at maintenance <coughs> uh, requirements and supplemental, not supplant requirements. Look at inaccurate or untimely reporting. Gosh, don't we hate that in the foundation world. So inaccurate reporting, somebody gives you data that's just made up. Uh, untimely, well, they haven't reported in a year. And these are trouble signs they're worth looking at. Who are you going to call? One of the first things that might not occur is call like-minded organizations. If you see something going on that you don't like, <coughs> you're not sure you like, and you're not sure it, it violates some of the intent of this, call each other. You know, again, if you add this to your portfolio, call on others who share your interests and you can learn in a community of practice from each other. Excuse me, call the implementing agencies. All of them are going to have accountability officers. One question will be, who do you call first? Do you go to Earl Devaney, recovery.gov, BP Biden, if you can get him? Or do you go to state first? I know there's probably some opinions in this room, but I think at the least, you have a lot of different options here. And as it happens, you can probably go to all of the above. So if you're looking at funds being spent Effectively and as intended, I'll stop that shtick. Um, if you're looking for funds to be spent effectively and as intended, these are the places to go. Last but not least, the nuclear bomb of going to the media. Mm. Takeaways. Shared responsibility. I can't say this enough. It's all of us. You know, it's one of those things where somebody says, okay, whose job is it to? What good news counts to? What we are about as a philanthropic community, what we are about as supporters of the great work that you do, is sir, and say something about it. We are blessed in Connecticut with, I think, some really hardworking, very, very good state bureaucrats. 
I often joke when we were doing the energy work, you know, about how many times you pick up your newspaper and it says, state bureaucrat saves world. I like that when you see that. So let's uh, make sure we understand that there are some really good people working in our state government, uh, a few of whom I think are here with us today. And remember as well that you all are creating good news. So thank you very much and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Review of all the opportunities and challenges we're facing uh, to Stuart uh, for a, for a equally wonderful overview of the accountability and, and uh, provisions here, and to Matt Fritz uh, for the perspective from the executive branch of state government about how this is being implemented in our state.